and we thank you for all the the work um, that goes into leading people to Christ and that leadership can come in many different forms we thank you for all those who are who have a heart for that kind of work Lord we ask you as always to be with Bonnie um, whatever that outcome may be also Brian and Kathleen um, they they both have need of prayer for a number of different reasons and you know what they are the Lord we also thank you for the ability to continue on your church will never die it sometimes is scary it sometimes weakens and falters but it will never die and we praise you for that in Jesus name amen um, we are verses 40 and 41. Finally, come on in the house, Ron. Oh, yeah, don't worry. <laughs> um, chapter 15, verses 40 to 41. And just to um, just to kind of catch up, we are actually at the crucifixion. Uh, we have covered the trial and, and all that went on leading up to this. And we're at the point where, chapter uh, verses 40 and 41, there were also women looking on from afar, among whom were Mary Magdalene, the mo uh, Mary the mother of James the Less, and of Joseph, and Salome, who also followed him and ministered to him, uh, when he was in Galilee and many other women who came up with him to Jerusalem. Um, Mary, the mother of James the Less and of Joseph, that is assumed to be Mary, the mother of Jesus. We don't know that for a fact um, simply because of the, uh, the handle James the Less um, we're not really sure who that is uh, as far as the genealogy. Uh, Jesus did have a brother named Joseph. So, but we, we'll leave it at that because it's not terribly important to the uh, narrative. So we'll just mess up, move on. Um, now the disciples had, as we remember, run away, had run for their lives. But these women had at least stayed close enough to be observers of his death. Those who would probably be most emotionally hurt because God willing, in most cases, women are more tender of spirit in situations like this yet they were the ones that had the nerve and the backbone to stick around and actually see it to completion um, and they had followed Jesus all along from Galilee now there are a lot of things that Mary Magdalene we're not going to get we're not going to digress about this but if anyone bothered to read the book or watch the movie The Da Vinci Code there's much that has been said by modern apologist or would-be apologist about Jesus actually having been married and having children, yada, yada, yada. Um, that's blasphemy, and nothing less than blasphemy. Um, and yes, there can be blasphemy in the 21st century. Uh, there's nothing, and we're not going to dwell on that, but I just put it to bed. Um, but the scriptures do show that Mary Magdalene was a faithful follower of Christ. Now, there are those who have actually a, a firm commitment to Mary Magdalene having been a prostitute. There is also no biblical explicit text that says that. There are some that imply that. But there's never anything that says explicitly 
that she was a woman of the street. That, for some peculiar reason, has been assumed. But go back through the New Testament Gospels, and you find me a verse that says, and the prostitute Mary Magdalene. You're not going to find it. So I don't know where that comes from. But she may have been, for all I know. But there's nothing explicitly that says so. It's in our imaginations or in our implications. The other thing is, um, the mother of James the Less and Joseph, again, uh, we already confirmed, and biblically it's confirmed, that Jesus had a brother named Joseph, but again, we're not sure about this, uh, this James. We cannot, all, we cannot be absolutely sure also as to who Salome was. Salome may have been Mrs. Zebedee. We don't know that for sure, though, because it doesn't specifically say so. So all I'm getting at here is that if it were important, if it were critical for us to know who these people were, we would know who they are. It is not of critical importance that we identify them or God would have identified them. Moving on to verses 40 and 40, uh, 42 and 43. Now, when the evening had come, because it was the preparation day. Now, preparation day for two things. Because apparently this year it fell um, for two occasions to be happening um, on the morrow, uh, the Sabbath and Passover. So they were preparing for both, and there were specific laws, Jewish laws, regarding the preparation for both the Sabbath and the Passover. We know that Jesus died at 3 p.m. in the afternoon on Friday. Jewish days began at 6 o'clock in the morning and ended at 6 p.m. Sometimes you can say, well, how did Jesus die on Friday and rise on Sunday and have that be three days? I only count two days. By the Jewish calendar, by the Jewish telling of time he rose on the third day um, presumably it was in, late in the afternoon if Jesus died at 3 p.m. it was after that uh, that Joseph of Arimathea went to Pilate <clears throat> begged for the body of Christ and you can imagine the time ticking away because I'm sure Joseph was not able to just run up to Pilate's home and walk right in the front door and have a consultation with Pilate. <laughs> Pilate did not like the Jews. He did not like being in Palestine. He knew he was being punished by being sent to Palestine. So he probably made Joseph wait. And the time was ticking for something to be done for Jesus before they would have to yank him down have his legs broken, yank him down off the cross, and throw him in the valley of Gehenna, which was a synonym for hell, or um, an, uh, an analogy of hell, because all the trash was thrown out in Gehenna, even the bodies of criminals. And the fires were kept burning 24-7, 365. And that's where Jew Jesus would have ended up with the other criminals. Somehow, Joseph got in there just in time um, and got permission to take over um, Jesus' body. Now, Mark identifies Joseph. Hey, Barry. Hey, Trudy. Mark identifies Joseph as a prominent member of the Sanhedrin, um, the very people that had or suffered Christ to be crucified, that arranged this sham in front of Pilate that led to Jesus' death. So that's telling us that not everyone on the Sanhedrin agreed. And now this is another thing. We talked about like six or seven things that were illegal in Jesus' trial. This is the last. Because for a capital, con uh, capital conviction to be legal, it had to be unanimous. And it obviously was not. So, um, Joseph had not consented. We know that Nicodemus probably did not either. Uh, 
Um, we, uh, let me get my head together here. We also know that Nicodemus at one point questioned the Sanhedrin's proce uh, proceedings against Jesus, but we don't <clears throat> hear specifically that he disagreed. Again, he probably did, but we don't know that. Um, and that Joseph helped prepare body, Jesus' body for burial, we learn in John chapter 19. Now, it says, taking courage, Joseph went to ask Pilate for the body. Once again, uh, there's every reason to believe it took some guts for Joseph to have done that. Because at that stage, I believe Pilate was just as likely to say, why don't you just go on with these guys, they'll show you where you need to go, and he may have ended up right next to him, I don't know. But in verse 44, Pilate's reaction was, it says, Pilate marveled that he was already dead. And summoning the, summoning the centurion, this was the uh, Roman officer in charge of the crucifixion, he asked him if he had been dead for some time. Now again, remember, people that were crucified, if they were particularly strong, and frankly, we know that Jesus was probably the strongest man to ever live. He may not have looked like Arnold Schwarzenegger, but he had it in him to probably have hung on as long as he wanted to hang on. People could live, survive this crucifixion for a couple of days. So it was common for people to live and take an entire 12 to 24 hour period to die. That's why they offered them that myrrh mixed with vinegar because it would dull the pain and have people, if you want to look at it from a positive standpoint, it wouldn't hurt as much. But knowing the Romans the way I do, it probably allowed them to live longer and suffer longer. So be that as it may, um, Pilate was surprised that Jesus was already dead. But again, there's a prophecy, not a bone was broken, that kept him from having his legs broken, which was the normal way to end um, uh, a crucifixion. Now, we just said that it could go on for days. Why would they go up and break the legs in this particular crucifixion of Jesus and the two thieves? Speed up the process. To speed up the process because to, to go along with the Jews, Pilate wanted to at least get them off of there before Passover and the Sabbath. That's offensive. So, um, it says in verse, uh, well, we all know that Pilate he granted Joseph access to the body. Uh, now, it says in verse 46 that he brought or bought fine linen, took him down and wrapped him in the linen, and he laid him in a tomb which had been hewn out of the rock and rolled a stone against the door of the tomb. Again, to wrap fine linen around the body, um, look, this was not the typical burial. It was for people of means. Okay? The average Jew did not get put in a coffin. A grave was dug in the ground and they were tossed in. Because what the Jews wanted was the bones. So the faster the Jewish body could decompose, the quicker they could get hold of the bones. And then the bones would be wrapped together and placed in a place of honor because the bones needed to survive in order for them to be resurrected. Them bones, them bones. They had to have them bones. Um, wealthy people, let's face it, if we had someone carve a tomb out of the granite up on one of these mountains, how much would that cost? Oh, wow. I don't know. I don't even know. Can't hazard a guess. But you can believe that even though the stone is softer in Jerusalem, it still would cost a pretty penny to have a tomb cut out of the rock. So not everybody could do that. Joseph apparently was one who could. And again, we have seen, Jeannie and I have had the privilege of seeing the, I don't know if it's Jesus' tomb or not, they say it is, but no one was there when it happened, so I don't know if it is or not. 
but literally, you stoop down in, in this rather large um, opening in this tomb, and there's literally a bed or a bench cut out of the rock, and a rock carved to have been a pillow, pillow for placing the head on. And it's just what you would imagine from what you read in Scripture. Um, nevertheless, uh, Joseph would have had to have paid to have that done. And normally, a square stone, for the less affluent, a square, and of course, caves could be used as well, a natural cave. Um, but a square stone would be put in front of the door to keep tomb robbers out. Joseph was wealthy enough to have a round stone and a gutter carved in the rock on the ground so the stone could roll. Nevertheless, this was not something that you, Mike and I are going to go and move. This was meant to keep people out and to protect the bones. Anyway, that's what he, where he was buried. Now, I want you to think of something. This is interesting because it comes up in um, our study of uh, First Peter that we're doing on Monday nights. Um, think back to chapter 14. The woman who emptied the alabaster flask to anoint Jesus for burial. That's the only anointing he got. And to give honor, respect, and love to the deceased, that's why they anointed it. It wasn't a preservative. They weren't trying to preserve the body because, once again, the faster the body decayed, the better, because then they could get them bones. So that's not why they did it. It was a, it was a show of honor and respect. They were to anoint that body... <coughs> before it was laid in the tomb. By the time Joseph got there, all he could do was wrap it and stick it in there. But Jesus had been anointed. In fact, he had gone beyond the normal anointing by being anointed with something that was so costly that the apostles got mad, the disciples got mad for the women using it. So Jesus did get, now I mean, that's trivia, I, I, I grant you it's trivia, but Jesus did get anointed, and Jesus said that that woman was anointing him for his death. He knew it. The apostles were just mad because it cost a lot of money. Notice that there was not a single freaking apostle there to anoint his body. It took someone from the Sanhedrin to do it that actually convicted him of the crime. How weird is that? I don't know. Nobody gets me, I guess. It struck me as very odd that that's how it would happen. And this, the irony, another irony that it, the Bible is just replete with. Um, but we'll move on to the final chapter. Well, one of the lessons I learned from this short little 42 to 47 about the women they should have been super busy preparing for Passover and for the Sabbath they should they, it was their job they should have been very very busy preparing s certain dishes and all but they made the crucifixion and Christ their priority absolutely how much do we need to make him our priority every verse in the Bible and frankly, this is just a pet peeve. I admit that. But people that say, I need a life lesson. I need you to apply the Bible to modern days and give me a lesson that applies today. Really? You can't get those for yourself just by reading Scripture? You can't make this apply to you? You need someone to, to give you a story that is applicable to today? I'm so, that again, and I'm sorry if anyone's like that because I just made you mad. But um, I, I just it's don't. It's an excuse. Yeah. It's an excuse because there's no new, no new sin under the sun. Everything just keeps going in the same direction. How, 
how can you read this and not have it convict you or apply itself to you? I mean, I, anyway, that, that's a rabbit trail. We'll go down that some other day. In fact, that day is rapidly a, approaching. Um, let's, let me go ahead and read these first eight verses. Now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene... Let me, let me back up a... No, no, I'll get, get that point here in a minute. Um, and the, you're used to this, I know. Uh, now, when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary, the mother of James, and Salome bought... bought Spices that they may come and anoint him. Very early in the morning, on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. Okay, they did skip the Sabbath. Okay, they did honor the Sabbath because they were good Jewish girls. Um, and they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? For us? But when they looked up, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. I bet they were. But he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples, and Peter... Why does he call out Peter here? Well, we'll talk Peter's about, the one who denied him. We'll talk about that here. You're right. He said he never would. Yep. Go tell the disciples and Peter that he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him as he said to you. So they went out quickly and fled from the tomb, for they trembled and were amazed. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Um, you could... I. I really believe, and maybe I'll get a chance, who knows. You could preach for months on these verses here. Just mm -hmm. on these verses here. Um, there are a couple of things that we want to go back and talk about um, that is displayed for us. And one of them, if anyone in here is listening to the class on Monday night of 1 Peter, we're going to be discussing tomorrow evening those infamous verses of Peter's about women submitting to their husbands. I can't tell you how glad I'm doing that on a on a uh, uh, what do you call streaming streaming. The fact of the matter is, is Jesus Christ and Christianity set women free. There was no freedom for women, but yet it's very common and popular for the last 50 years for a feminist movement to say that Christianity cripples women and puts them in chains and back in the kitchen where they belong. Nothing could be further from the truth and there is an excellent example of what I'm talking about right here. The fact of the matter is a woman's testimony ranked with that of a slave and a criminal in a Jewish court. They would allow slaves and criminals to testify in court before a woman. And here the entire foundation of our faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ is from the testimony of three women. Our entire faith. Everything. Don't tell me that women are oppressed by Christianity. They are oppressed by bad men, and they are oppressed by their own bad choices. That's what oppresses women today, not Christianity. So, having said that, we will continue on. Um, again, I, I can't speak to how strange it is that all the gospel writers, the synoptic gospels, all faithfully report that it was women that first were told or were met by Christ to announce his resurrection. Just as a, an angel came to tell Mary that she was going to be the mother of this Christ initially. Now, um, 
Verses 1 and 2, now when the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, etc., etc. Um, they obviously, first thing in the morning, had gone to a market to bought, buy spices, to anoint the body properly. This, however, this anointing after the fact, now we read this and we don't pay much attention to it, but the body out of respect was to be anointed before it was buried. Okay? Why would Mary, the Marys and Salome, go to the tomb to anoint it after the fact for no other reason than to show their devout love and devotion to Jesus? That's the only reason they would waste the time and the money to do it. That's the only reason they would do it. It was important to them to anoint him. Because the practice was not to, again, preserve the body, but to show love and respect to the, to the corpse. In chapter 14, we look at Mark's narrative about the anointing of his body, which we've already discussed. Um, this was the woman who fell on her knees and, and poured the entire bottle of ointment, which we determined was practically valued at a year's pay or a laborer. Now, I don't know how that woman got it. Probably either through an inheritance, which it made something worth that much, may have been passed down generation to generation. She may have done other things to earn it. I don't know. It doesn't matter because ultimately she knew the value of Christ and she used it to anoint his body. Um, uh, verse 3, they said among themselves, who will roll away the stone? They didn't have to worry about that. That stone was already moved. Already moved. Um, they unexpectedly found the tomb open. Uh, and Matthew tells us, behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone himself. Uh, that's in Matthew chapter... 28. Um, in other words, God himself opened the tomb. God opened the tomb. And then it goes on in verse 5, and entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in long... Now, not surprisingly, they were disturbed by this. Um, but we get different descriptions. In uh, Matthew, it says his countenance was like lightning, um, his clothing as white as snow, in Luke, it says he was wearing shining garments. There's enough there for us to realize that it was a supernatural being. I don't think, again, this was Arnold Schwarzenegger dressed in shining clothes that moved that rock back and was waiting in the tomb for the ladies to show up. Um, but there's something here. It says the women were alarmed when they saw this person. The actual translation of the Greek is it's more accurate to say that they were profoundly afraid, which would indicate falling on their knees, covering up their heads and shivering. They were that afraid um, of what they saw. How afraid would you be if you encountered something holy? I would be standing around, that's for sure. No, I would not be exactly. And any time anybody in the Bible has encountered holiness, what they, do they do? They've reacted they the same way. Yeah, they've reacted the same way. Um, but some of the synoptic Gospels, I can't remember right now, which I think both Matthew and Luke say there were two angels. Mark only mentions one. And the naysayers say, would call that a contradiction. Textual critics call that a contradiction. Look. If there were two angels there, were there one? Yeah. At least one. At least there was one. at least one. Nowhere in Scripture does it say there were two angels there, and that's it. Nowhere does it say there was one angel there, period. So there's no contradiction. You can imply one if you want to. If that's your nature, if that's what you, your view of Scripture, you can imply one. 
but there is no explicit contradiction because no one says there was only one. Right. I will say that in Mark's defense, if these women had saw one and were so terrified, they probably they weren't be looking. looking for the other one. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, only one of them spoke to them, though. Well, that's right. And it may be that there... I, it may have been two, but they weren't looking for that. All I know one. is that this is not a contradiction because manifestly, if there were two angels, there was one. Yeah. Okay. Don't get hung up when people point out that kind of stuff. Think it through. And by the way, that's what we're going to be talking about next week for those who are bold enough to show up. <laughs> um, let's see. Verse 6. Uh, but he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus. Um, then came the most unexpected and most fantastic announcement in the history of the world. He is risen. Now, the angel was very clear that he was talking about Jesus. He said, Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He wasn't talking about anybody else. He was talking about Jesus. Now, once again, the Greek translation is not entirely accurate because there's no English word to directly translate it. To say that he is risen is more accurately translated, he has been risen. What's the difference? He is risen implies that the dead man in that tomb had the ability to raise himself. What does that do to the gospel? He kills it. Because if Jesus had the power to raise himself, was he really dead? Yeah, and that would be the first thing they'd ask. Mm -hmm. Did of he course really die? not. If he had the power to raise himself, what does that tell you about his ability to die? He can't die. He can't die if he can raise himself. He'd die. Oh, I'm awake again. He'd die if his heart would stop. Oh, I'm awake again. If he has that power, he's not really dead because who that is really dead does that? Ronnie, do you expect to be able to do that when they put you, put you away? No, don't think so. No, don't think so. Who raised Jesus from the tomb? God. God the Father. Jesus did not raise himself. God the Father did. Why is this important? Because of what we just talked about. If he's capable of raising himself, he's not really dead. I'm sorry if that goes against what you may have thought, but that's what the scripture says. That's what he implies. And that's why he is risen. And I know every Easter we splatter it all over everywhere. And I, I, I get that. Yeah, he's risen, but he didn't raise himself. That was part of the eternal covenant of salvation. God the Father planned. Jesus did the work. The Holy Spirit came after the fact to convince, of it, convince us of its truth through the word. The Father's part was to raise Jesus from the dead. Jesus did the work. Okay? I'm not going to belabor that, but... Then it, uh, being being <coughs> a uh, old Presbyterian, too... Nicene Creed, it says he even descended into hell. Yeah. So, <laughs> and I mean, you know, that tells you he he's dead, dead. <laughs> <laughs> he's dead. Um, and I don't know about all that, but yeah, I, I know what you're yeah. saying. Uh, then we'll go on to verse seven. But go tell his disciples and Peter. We've kind of alluded to that. Um, if And this is not in the text anywhere. I'm just, you're allowed to read between the lines when it's not doctrine, okay? I visualize the angel having to say, and Peter, because if I were Peter and I realized what was going on, I would probably have done to myself what Judas did to himself. I would be so distraught that I may have ended my life. 
And I think this happens like this because, look, let Peter know. Another aspect of it that hit me was the fact that Peter was the leader. So therefore, you know, he was singled out too because he was the leader. So, you know, tell the disciples, but tell Peter that, you know, start looking for him. He say he's out there. He's coming. <laughs> yep. Well, that, may, that would make sense too. Although I don't suspect that Peter felt much like a yeah, leader yeah, at yeah, this yeah, particular yeah, yeah. point in time. Yeah, but right. he was, and I think this was a call for him to come back into that position. Um, how forgiving would one have to be to say, hey, um, you could have saved me. You promised to save me. Um, you didn't even get wounded, let alone die for me. Um, but I still want you to feed my sheep and lead my apostles or my disciples. Well, didn't he tell Peter that he would be sifted like wheat by Satan, mm -hmm. but when the trial was over, he was to come and lead Yes, in another translation, another gospel is put yeah. that way. Um, in verse 8, they went out quickly from the tomb. The important point here in, in this <laughs> verse is, and they said nothing to anyone. Or they were afraid. Well, again, naysayers would have it that this is another contradiction. They said nothing. Well, wait a minute. The next verses say they told everybody. Look, I'm thinking, like we just discussed, the women probably popped up out of that tomb after being terrified by this angel and ran to the boys to tell them what was going on. They didn't stop to tell to anybody so I think that's what they're they're saying here and again this is underlying the fact um, that women's testimony and you can see this and we're going to talk about it here in a minute you can see this in the way the disciples responded to the testimony of the women they didn't pay any attention to them either they didn't believe them so that's where even though Mary, Mary, and Salome had been with them through thick and thin, had been through all the good times, all the bad times, had nurtured these guys, had taken care of, of feeding them, probably washing and mending their clothes, and all that other stuff. Through three years on the road, when they testified to the disciples, the disciples didn't believe them. They were just women. And when push came to shove, when Jesus, and we'll hear this in a minute, Jesus reprimanded the disciples for not listening to him, which is another testimony of the freedom of women in Christ. Why didn't you believe my witnesses? Women are of equal value to you. They have different roles. They have different jobs. All that is true, like it or not, all that is true, according to Scripture. But they are equal in every way. The only reason I made you the headship is because there has to be a tiebreaker in the family or nothing will ever get done. And it's a, it, it, unfortunately, it is, to me, shameful to see the way men have given up their role of leadership in the family. Because not two, for two reasons. They have been convinced that they don't have any right to it. Or number two, they have been so emasculated that they don't believe they're man enough to lead a family. And no Christian man should ever feel that way. It doesn't mean that you don't ask your wife for advice. It doesn't mean you don't discuss things. But when push comes to shove, it's your role to make the final decision. I, take it up with God. I didn't make this stuff up. Anyway, the last Jesus farewell comes in the last several verses. I'm going to go ahead and read them. Uh, now, when he rose early on the uh, now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. 
she went and told those who had been now a lot of people don't like this and I'm going to pre preface this I should have probably done that this before instead of later not all the ancient script of uh, um, manuscripts have these last verses in them this is what is referred to in theological circles as the long ending for Mark a lot of the more ancient manuscripts end with verse 8 and I, I believe that someone probably later in the first century added these verses to the end okay? that does not make them wrong and it does not make them unscriptural because all the other apostles agreed to this addition but I don't believe Mark wrote this because there are a lot of manuscripts that do not contain these. Anyway, we're going to go over them anyway. Um, she went and told those who had been with him uh, as they wept and mourned, and when they heard that he was alive and had not been seen by her, they did not believe. After that, he appeared in another form to two of them as they walked and went into the country, and they went and told it to the rest, and they did not believe them either. Good gosh later <laughs> he appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table and he rebuked them for their hardness of heart and he said to them go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature he who believes and is baptized will be saved uh, we're not going to harp on that too much today we'll save that for the next week or two um and who, had, who does not believe will be condemned. Let me tell you, folks, um, when Jesus comes the second time, he's not coming to judge. The judgment's already happened. It's a sentencing hearing. When he comes back, he's going to come back to sentence those who are already condemned. Yes, say. Um, in my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents. I gotta get into this because this is the dumbest stuff how people take this. Um, now, one word about the addition to or to or Mark's long ending as opposed to the short ending. Even if as it, I think it probably was added later, and not much later, but within the, like the next 50 years. Think of it this way. In Washington, D.C. is the National Institute of Standards and Technology. Okay? The official yardstick resides in the National Institute of Standards. The official yardstick. I mean, this is a yard. All those wooden yardsticks you buy in the craft store, they're probably slightly different than this yardstick that's in Washington, D.C. Does that keep you from using it? Does that keep you from not trusting it to be a yard, even if it's an eighth of an inch off? Or even a quarter of an inch off? That's the same way with the long or short ending of Mark, as far as I'm concerned. It agrees with other scripture, and apparently um, one of the folks in the know thought this was a better ending than just chopping it off at verse 8 like Mark seemed to have done. Anyway, enough on that. Um, the reason I mention that is because this will come up if you are trying to witness to someone who at least knows something of the Bible. And let me tell you what they know about the Bible is typically those things that are called into uh, dispute or what we they want to call a contradiction, which aren't. But that's what they know. They have never probably read the Bible cover to cover at all. They certainly have not studied the Bible. And I'll tell you, reading and studying are two completely different things. A lot of people read the Bible and don't learn a thing. Study requires work. 
Anyway, um, when biblical uh, scholars try to determine what's in the original uh, manuscripts, they typically find just the first eight verses. Enough of that. Um, but let's talk about how they reacted. Mary Magdalene um, encountered Jesus, and he went. And, she went and told the guys. Later, Jesus appeared to two of them. Um, all these people went, and it was only when he appeared to all 11 of them in the same place at the same time that they went, hey, he really is risen. It took that, and I think maybe because of the uh, um, embarrassment, um, like the rest of the gospel, Mark didn't get into it any more deeply than that. But he did say, because remember, Mark went out of his way. I know he said twice. Mark went out of his way to intimate that he was the one who was wrapped in linen that went to see what was going on in the Garden of Gethsemane and was the one that they grabbed hold of the linen and he ran away naked. So he was trying to say without being, hey, I'm one of the guys too. He was trying to let us know that he was an eyewitness of some of this. So Mark may have been including himself when Jesus reprimanded them for the hardness of their heart. I mean, can you imagine how you could have been a disciple and still had such a hard heart? Anyway. Uh, verses 15 and 16 go into all the world preach the gospel to every creature this is the mission that Christ gave to his church we are to preach the gospel the good news has defined and definite content as we see from the apostolic record I've said this time and time again the further we get away from the, the apostles in the New Testament, the more wrong we become. It has to do with the announcement of the person. Look, the gospel is not to run and tell everyone. The primary purpose of the gospel is not to run and tell everyone that God loves us and he has a wonderful plan for our lives. Because his plan for our life is not necessarily wonderful. It may not be. And if it isn't, do you still honor God for the plan that he has in your life? I hope so. But that's not the real purpose. The gospel is not that if we come to Christ, we will automatically or mysteriously discover the purpose of our lives. I don't know about y'all, that didn't happen for me. That's not the purpose. The gospel is not my te personal testimony, nor is it yours. It has to do with the announcement of the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. The gospel is about Christ, not about us. The Bible is about Christ and not about us. We have a tendency to make all the purposes of God and His Son and the Holy Spirit about us. It's not. God sent Jesus to glorify Himself. We're the beneficiaries of that. The fact that God, a holy God, can still bring us back to himself. How does he do that? It's only through this eternal covenant of salvation that God can make that possible. Only God can do that. This is about glorifying God and the person and ministry of Jesus Christ. We are merely beneficiaries of that. And we should rejoice, and that should be the purpose of the joy that is in us, as Peter calls us to describe in 1 Peter chapter 3, I believe it is. 
Um, that's why we should have joy. Now, notice here, I'm going to read this real quick and then we'll call it a day. Uh, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Jesus goes on to say, he who does not believe will be condemned. He who does not believe. He does not say, he do, who does not believe and is not baptized. Baptism does not have anything to do with salvation. But it is inferred by some people from this verse. Um, however, the rest of the New Testament, all the bulk of the New Testament makes it very clear that the only absolutely necessary condition for our salvation is faith. Period. We are justified by faith. Um, and people will do signs, just a quick minute. These signs that are talked about here were done in apostolic times to uh, forward push forward the gospel it's very clearly stated that if you speak in tongues keep your mouth shut unless you have somebody that will interpret what you're saying otherwise it's just gibberish it does not infer that you should go and pick up snakes to prove that you believe God's testimony good because I ain't going to yep. <laughs> um, but me there neither are, there are people you know there are mm. people it's uh, especially uh, prominent in eastern Tennessee that they pick up snakes a lot of them have been bitten <laughs> but they continue so don't make a bigger deal out of that this was in apostolic times to forward the gospel um, and I would say as far as an inference uh, trying to trump an explicit statement we're told in Deuteronomy and again in Matthew that we are not to tempt the Lord our God. And I think picking up poisonous snakes is very much tempting the Lord your God. Um, and thus ends Mark. Mark. Any questions or concerns?